Hey guys, Miss Marusik here, and in this video, we're going to look at identifying key forces that hold a substance together. Um, what would we need to break to get it to transition from a solid to a liquid to a gas? And then based on that information, making a prediction on which substance might have a higher melting point or boiling point. So to start us off here, our first um, matchup is MgCl2 versus PCl3. And so the first thing I want to do to identify my forces um, holding a substance together is that I want to see if it's ionic or covalent. Um, for MgCl2, that's a metal-nonmetal combination, so that's ionic, whereas PCl3 is non-metal-nonmetal, and so that would be covalent. Now, once I've made that identification, if I see a substance is ionic, metallic, or network covalent, then what that means is that bonds are what I would need to break to go between a solid, a liquid, and a gas. Now remember, network covalent is when I have um, carbon um, in an allotrope, like diamond or graphite, or I might have silicon dioxide, which is glass. Okay, so if I have network covalent, metallic, or ionic, then I'm breaking bonds to go from a solid to a liquid to a gas. Now, PCL3 was covalent, and it's not one of those network covalent ones. It doesn't have carbon or silicon in it. Um, and so there I'm going to identify my types of IMFs. So first off being covalent, I know I would have London dispersion forces. And then I would need to ask myself, okay, well, is it polar or nonpolar? If it's nonpolar, then London dispersion is your only type. If it's polar, then I would have dipole-dipole and even possibly also hydrogen bonding. Um, so I need to draw this out really quick to kind of figure out what's going on here. Uh, PCL3 ends up being trigonal pyramidal. Looks like this with an unshared electron pair at the top. So that's what throws it into that trigonal pyramidal shape. And so I can see that that would be polar. And so that means I would for sure also have the dipole-dipole IMFs. However, I would not have hydrogen bonding because I don't even have hydrogen in that substance. So if I want to identify which substance in the pair would have higher melting or boiling point values, keep in mind that with MgCl2, I'm trying to break bonds, whereas PCl3, I'm just trying to break IMFs. And so I might write something like so. I would put MgCl2 would have higher melting point, boiling point values as it takes more energy to break those stronger bonds than it takes to break weaker intermolecular forces. Remember, we talked about in the last video that bonds are stronger attractions. And so since I need more energy to break those, that's where that melting point and boiling point would increase. All right, let's look at our next duo here. Our next duo is diethyl ether and 2-butanol. So I'm going to start off by, again, identifying what kind of substances I have here. Um, both of these are covalent. They're both non-metal, non-metal combinations. And they're not like diamond or graphite or silicon dioxide or anything like that. So they're not the network covalent. And so that means I can identify some intermolecular forces here. Um, first off, being covalent, they would both have London dispersion forces. So I'm going to write that for both of them here. Um, and then I would ask myself, okay, well, are they polar or nonpolar? Now that's where it gets a little tricky for the diethyl ether. A lot of people get confused on that one, um, on whether or not it's polar or nonpolar, because at first glance it looks symmetrical. However, keep in mind that the way they drew this is all in a line, but this molecule really isn't all in a line. That oxygen here with those four domains and two unshared electron pairs would end up with an angle less than 109.5. And in reality, that that structure would end up looking something like this. So I built that molecule and you can see like once I built it and it's not in a line anymore, there is no way to get this molecule symmetrical. Um, it is going to have that bent structure that is going to automatically always make it polar. So anytime you have 
anything more than just carbons and hydrogens in those organic molecules, it is for sure going to be polar. And so that means you're also going to have dipole dipole. Now, I think that was a little easier to identify on this one because we can see very clearly there that OH, that alcohol group that makes that one also be polar and gives us dipole dipole. Now, once I see I have dipole dipole, um, I would also want to ask myself, do I have hydrogen bonding? Do I have a hydrogen with nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine in the molecule that would cause the hydrogen bonding attractions to another molecule that also has that present. Now here I have hydrogen and I have oxygen, but they're not bonded to each other. And so I don't get that big electronegativity difference in that bond. And so I don't get that very polar moment that would help it to make those hydrogen bonding force attractions. However, here I do have the oxygen and the hydrogen bonded together. So this one would have the additional hydrogen bonding IMFs. So now if I'm trying to figure out who's got the higher melting boiling points, I would probably jot down something like this. I would say the 2-butanol would have the higher melting point boiling point values, this guy here, because these were both about the same size, meaning their Lenin dispersion forces would be about the same because they have the same number of electrons. There's not one that's more polarizable than another. Um, yet this one had that extra intermolecular force type. It had the hydrogen bonding. And so that increases the total strength of the IMFs, especially since the type that we're adding is one of the strongest types. So that definitely helped here. All right, we got one more on the next page to look at at the top here, CH3OH versus CH3CH2OH. Now at first glance, this one kind of looks weird in the way they have um, put this down. They haven't given us or drawn us a structure here, but that doesn't mean we can't figure it out. Um, organic chemists tend to write compounds in this kind of segmented order because it gives us some information about what that structure actually looks like. CH3OH, that would be a carbon bonded to three hydrogens. bonded to an oxygen, bonded to a hydrogen. Now, as we know, oxygen likes to make two bonds with two unshared electron pairs, so I'm gonna throw those on here. Now, this one, the reason why it's listed in order like that is because I would have a carbon with my three hydrogens on it, so there's my CH3. That would then be bonded to a carbon with two hydrogens on it, and then that would be then bonded to an OH, an alcohol group. Okay, so I can see very clearly that both of these are covalent, and so both of these would have Lennon dispersion IMFs. And I'm like, well, both are very clearly polar. I have more than just carbon-hydrogen chains, and there's no way these are symmetrical. And so I would also have dipole-dipole IMFs. And if I keep on looking here, I'm like, okay, well, once I check for that, I want to check for hydrogen bonding. And I'm like, oh, well, I have oxygen bonded to hydrogen in both of these. So both of these molecules can make those hydrogen bonding force attractions to other molecules. So both of them would have hydrogen bonding IMFs as well. And you're like, okay, well, that means they all have the same types. Where do I go from here? Well, there's a couple ways you can go from here. The next thing I would check is, since I had hydrogen bonding present, I would check to see if one of these molecules had more spots of hydrogen bonding potential forces than others. Like for example, let's say one of these molecules had a, a location for hydrogen bonding on this side, but also on the other side of the molecule. Having it multiple places would mean that I would have more stronger attractions, and so therefore that would help my strength. But both of these only really have one location where hydrogen bonding IMFs could form with another molecule, and so that's not really going to help me. Um, so then the next thing I would do is I would consider my Lenin dispersion forces. Now the two things we can consider there is that if these had had the same formula, 
but maybe were just organized differently, I could check for surface area. Remember, longer chains have more surface area, and so those have more polarizability, versus less chains, more branching occurring, would have less surface area. And so that would have less polarizability. Um, but here, they're different formulas, so that doesn't help me. So then the next thing I would look at is my total number of electrons. This CH3, CH2OH, it has more atoms and stuff in it, and having more atoms would mean that a lot of times I would have more electrons too. And so here's kind of the thing I would probably put for a question like this. I would say something along the lines of the fact that CH3, CH2, OH would have higher melting point, boiling point values due to having more total electrons, which leads to a more polarizable electron cloud, which leads to increased temporary dipole moments and therefore stronger London dispersion forces. So that same statement that we looked at in the last video, like going through that chain of those statements to tie our way to having stronger London dispersion forces would help us to argue that it should have the higher melting point boiling point values. All right, we're going to do a lot more with these um, free response questions next class, where we're going to become experts on being able to justify questions on which substance would have higher or lower melting and boiling points. And we're also going to add some other trends that can be explained with IMFs as well, um, volatility and vapor pressure. So we're going to add to our list of things that we're going to be able to explain with using these intermolecular force types and identifications. So anyways, if you have any questions or need any help, please feel free to email me. Bye, guys.